Grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship. The Lord be with you. I'm not sure if my microphone is working right now, but we'll get that fixed in a second. Um, I do have a couple of quick announcements. One, thank you for coming to worship on the holiday weekend. The faithful, we are all here gathered on this first Sunday in July to glorify our Lord. Um, I'm excited to have someone new helping me to lead worship this morning. Bill is out on vacation with his family, so we have Carol Ferry, a friend of ours from the congregation, who is um, the head of the Tarboro Conservancy of Music on Main Street. Conservatory. Conservatory, excuse me, <laughs> um, of music. And we're thrilled to have her with us. She is a very accomplished musician, um, particularly a pianist, and so she will be helping us lead worship. She and her husband Gustav moved down here last year and has, she's been worshiping with us and we're just thrilled that she's going to share her gifts with us as we glorify the Lord this morning. Um, to that end, she'll be on the piano. Our organ is slowly but surely getting positioned. Um, this week they will be in to voice it and to tune it um, and so they are going to literally hole up in here and they'll be in here for two to three days and they'll be playing every note and making sure that it sounds perfect for this particular space and we are hoping that next Sunday July 9th will be the first time that Bill will be able to play the organ. The other thing I want to mention about the organ you should have received your newsletter the messenger in the mail and in there there's an appeal from the organ renovation committee and from the congregation to the congregation to help us replenish the funds that were generously given by a previous generation to care for an asset of our church for generations to come. So we ask that you give generously. There's a note in the messenger and it's a campaign that we will conduct over the month of July. So you'll hear more from us and from that particular committee over the course of July. So we invite you to give generously to support an asset of our church for years to come. The other things are on the back of your bulletin. VBS is a week from today. There is a work day at one point uh, this Thursday, actually two points, at 10.30 and 6 p.m. And there, um, it starts next Sunday. The other thing I do want to mention on the back, the middle group for our fellowship event is happening a w two weeks from today, excuse me, July 16th at the home of uh, Dawn and Ted Whitehurst. And that is openly understood of 40-ish to 60-ish, or if you feel like you fall within that range and want to attend, you are welcome to attend. And that is happening two weeks from tonight. Friends, we had a death in our congregation. Bill Gilbert, who was a longtime member of this church um, before he moved to Williamston and then actually moved back about a year or so ago, died yesterday. Um, so please keep Zell, his daughter, in your prayers. There is going to be a visitation on Wednesday evening at Carlisle Funeral Home um, at 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And there will be a graveside service at Greenwood Cemetery at 11 a.m. on Thursday morning. And that will, I'm meeting with Zell after worship and we'll finalize plans and make those known to the congregation as well as it will be on Carlisle's website. Remember that those that die in the Lord, they rest from their labors and their works surely follow them. Friends, let us quiet our hearts and our minds as we begin worship with the morning prelude.
I invite you to stand and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Come, let us worship God. God calls us by name. We respond this call by the grace of God and respond by worshiping and glorifying God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us life through water and the Holy Spirit. We gather in this space so you might teach us to live always in obedience to your love as your Son, Jesus, did. Amen. You may be seated. We turn now to the call and the prayer of confession, both of which are found in your bulletins. How costly is our broken relationship with God? The price of sin is a spiritless life, which is no life at all. Let us confess, repent, and trust God to forgive us our sin. O oh God, on lonely Mount Moriah, you put your servant Abraham to the test. We confess that we have failed easier tests of our faith. We have allowed sin to run our lives, to shape how we act toward others, and to kill our relationship with you. In your great mercy, forgive us. Amen.
hear the words that we will soon hear in worship in the coming weeks. The Apostle Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not sin, not death, nothing. The Lord comes to us in the waters of baptism and reminds each of us that we are forgiven. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated, and we invite all the children forward for our time with children this morning. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was thinking this morning, did you hear that song that just came on? Did you hear her playing it? What was it? Does anyone know? What was it? Yes, we sang that one first. Did you hear the music that was played as you came up here? It was Jesus Loves Me. How many of you have ever heard that song or sung that song before? Me too. I love that song. So first I want us to think for just a second. I want to introduce someone to you. My mom. Mom, will you raise your hand? Yeah, she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> That's my mom. And I know every day, all day, no matter what, my mom loves me. How many of you know that about someone in your life? No matter what, they're going to love you. Yes. And my mom loves me so much that sometimes when she does this face at me, that means I've probably made a mistake, right? And I don't like to disappoint her. How many of you don't like to disappoint your mom or dad, right? And guess what? I'm human, and sometimes I make mistakes, and I disappoint my mom, and I feel terrible about it. But guess what I always remember? She loves me. Now, there's something even more important than that. Someone that loves me even more than my mom, and that is like, whoo, blows my mind. And that's Jesus. Jesus loves you more than anything, and no matter how many mistakes you make, even when you're trying not to, he's going to always love you. And so I've been thinking a lot about that Jesus Loves Me song and how important it is to remember every day, because if you know that Jesus loves you, it's a lot easier to not make as many mistakes. When you're having problems with self-control, you say, Jesus loves me. I can do this. So from now on, we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me, all of us, as you children come forward. So every time you come forward, we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me so we can remember that. Can you sing it with me now? Can you all sing it with me now so that we can remember it? You're like, no. Yes, please. <laughs> so um, can y'all, will you stand up? Because it's easier to sing. Will y'all stand up? You don't have to stand up every time, but this time will you stand up? Very brave, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you did an excellent job. And I want you this week and in the weeks to come to remember that Jesus truly loves you, loves you no matter what. Can you fold your hands? Can you fold your hands? Can you bow your heads and can you pray with me? 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Help us this week to remember it and to feel the peace that comes with it. And to feel the peace that comes with it. With it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Living God, help us to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing may we follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, and you may find that on page uh, 17 of your pew Bibles. Let us listen to the word of God. After these things, God tested Abram. He said to him, Abraham, and he And he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering offering and set out and went to the place in the in the distance that God had shown him on the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place far away then Abraham said to his young men stay here with the donkey and I will go over there we will worship and then we will come back to you Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire in the night. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, lost my place there. I've never been able to see on a straight line. (laughs) <laughs> Let me get my marker out here. One eye or one ear or something is off. Okay. Please excuse me. Let's, let's see. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac t- said to his father, Abraham, Father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering to my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said Abraham Abraham and he said here I am he said do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him for now I know that you fear God and since you have not withheld my son your son your only son from me and Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. 
On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Our second reading this morning is from the Paul's letter to the church in Rome that we're continuing to study throughout this summer, these summer months, excuse me. We're going to pick up chapter 6, where we left off chapter 6 last week. We'll start in chapter 6 at verse 12. And remember, Paul is writing to a group of people that he has not met. He knows some of them through other connections. But he's writing to them, and they're asking questions of him, and he's responding to those questions from afar. And one of those questions that continuously comes up is, if Jesus came 
taught, performed miracles, and died for us, and was raised for us, and grace is everywhere, then what do we do? How are we supposed to live the Christian life? And so Paul continuously answers that, and remember the majority of the people that Paul, not the majority, but some of the people are Jewish, and so they think to follow the law is the way that you're to be a Christian. And Paul says the law has a place, but it is not the only thing. So this morning, we're going to learn a little bit more about what we are called to be as 21st century Christians, which is very similar to what Paul was calling the first century Christians. Listen to a word from our Lord through the Apostle Paul. Verse 12 begins, Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies. Don't make it obey your passions or their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. No, no, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. Since you're no longer under the law, but you're under grace. What then? Should we sin because we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you presented yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads you to a life of righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Remember, friends, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The question that's at the heart of Paul's portion of his letter this morning is, what does it mean to be a servant of God? He calls it being a slave to righteousness or a slave to obedience, but it's the same word in Greek for servant, so we'll use servant. What does it mean to be a servant of God? What we're going to find as we dig into Paul's letter, and what we're going to find as we talk about it amongst us here is that Paul is inviting us to slow down and to linger in a space. And the hard part about this is that we, well, maybe I should say I want to, and I wonder if you're the same way, I don't want to stay just in the what does it mean to be a servant of God. I want, I want to talk about how are we servants of God. How do we live the life of faith through our worship, through our education, through our pastoral care, through our leadership, right? That's where we want to jump to, and Paul is inviting us to slow down. He was inviting the first Christians that he was writing to to slow down because they wanted to get to the law of Moses. Or if the law of Moses was no longer necessary, then the law of Paul, Jesus, whomever, they just wanted something. Tell us what to do is essentially what they are asking. And Paul wants us to linger with this question. What does it mean to be a servant of God? It's an incredibly challenging question when we dig into it. And I got to thinking about a a friend of mine who is a pastor, and he was telling me about his seminary internship year. He did an internship for the whole school year at a church much like a Howard Memorial. And part of his internship was to meet with the pastor, to preach, to teach, to sing, to do all these different things. And he was excited about this, but he was really, really excited about the conversations, the one-on-one conversations with the pastor, because he was going to find out what it meant to be a minister. How do you do pastoral care? How do you write a sermon? How do you structure your week? He would come in for 10 to 15 hours a week, and he became increasingly frustrated over the weeks because the pastor 
didn't care for his questions. Every time he would ask him, how do you prepare your week? He would say, tell me your answer to this question. Who do you think God is? What do you think it means to you to be a minister? And he said, my friend said, I- I'm talking about that stuff in school. I don't want to talk about that with you. So he became increasingly frustrated, and he shared these frustrations with his friends. And this was around the time that that movie Karate Kid, y'all remember that movie Karate Kid was coming out. And one of his friends said, you know what he's doing? He's, he's Mr. Miyagi to your Daniel. And he's teaching you, you remember how you, like, Daniel used to paint, and he was like, why am I painting? I used to scrub the car. Why am I scrubbing the car? Because you're learning lessons of how to do karate. That's what he's teaching you. My friend said, okay, that's good. I I feel better about this. And he was sitting in the office one day, and the secretary ran in and said, the pastor has called. A good, faithful member of this church had surgery, and he needs you to go visit him. Now, this gentleman was a former pastor who had retired to the area, and he thought, I'm going to get all my questions answered at this hospital. So he raced over to the hospital, and he sat down, and he sat with the man, and he went through the pleasantries. How are you? How'd your surgery go? The man told him the answers to the question. He said, well, I have a, I have a couple more questions. Um, can you tell me how you write a sermon? Can you tell me how you do communion? And the man looked at him and said, I have no desire to talk about this. Son, I just had surgery. He said, but I really want to know these things. And he said, I don't want to talk about this. And then he paused for a really, really long time. He said, could you just sit with me? Could you just sit with me in this next hour or so and remind me that I'm not alone and that God still cares for me? And my friend said that was the most powerful moment in his seminary education and maybe even in his ministry that he was asked and invited to just be. To present himself to the Lord, as Paul says, by just sitting there. And he said it framed his ministry for years to come that sometimes, more often than not, we're called to just present ourselves, to wait to proclaim ourselves to the Lord by just being there. When we reread Paul's sixth chapter and the verses that I read, he talks a lot about presenting yourself. What does it mean to be a servant of God? It means to just present yourself. What does that mean, though? In some ways, it's an answer, another form of an answer, to the first question of our catechism. Some of you may be able to answer this. What is the chief end of humanity? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To just be. Paul is inviting us to slow down and not get to the how-tos to live the faith, but just to be. And in the process, something amazing happens. We proclaim with our presence that the Lord still speaks. That the Lord still speaks. That when we present ourselves and we sit in hospital rooms, we hear the Lord through our presence with another. That when we take the time to show up, the Lord still speaks. The Roman church wanted the law. They wanted something to hold on to. They wanted something to say, this is the way you do it. And Paul said, slow down. Present yourselves to the Lord. Become servants of the Lord. In just a little bit, we're going to break bread together, and we're going to pour the cup and celebrate the Lord's Supper. And you'll see something a little bit different. When the elders come forward, they're actually going to carry the bread, and they're going to carry the pitcher. And it's going to be our presentation to the Lord that we're here. And we're going to do communion by intinction, which is a form of us saying yes to God's grace. And we come forward and we present ourselves to the Lord. And then we'll go back to our pews, and at the end of the service, they're actually going to take the bread and the pitcher back out as our lives do not exist only in here.